to see which heats are the good ones and so. But many times this is not enough. We want to also quantify. For example, if we have two cell states, one treated with a drug and the other one uh, as a control, we want to know which proteins are different in each of the states. And also another example would, would be to, oh, sorry, to have a time course experiment. For example, we treat uh, some cells with a drug and we want to see which is the effect of this drug over the time. So for doing that, we need quantitative proteomics. But uh, things are being each time more complex. So as we saw yesterday, we never identify the whole proteome in a complex sample. We only identify a portion of it because of technological limitations. But uh, when we want to quantify, uh, we need high quality data. And sometimes uh, what happens is that we can even quantify less proteins than the one that we identify, okay? So there are many methods for quantitative proteomics. I don't want that this class is a mere catalog of these methods. So first of all, I want to introduce you some concepts that I think are important. And then we will see some examples. It's not an exhaustive review. I just choose some examples of methods that I think uh, are pretty relevant, okay? But before starting, I need to say that mass spectrometry is not quantitative. So what do I mean when I say that? Well, what I mean is that, for example, in this case, that you have this peptide with this signal and this other peptide with this signal, this does not mean that we have more of this peptide than this. Why? For example, it can happen that we have 50 femtomoles of this peptide and 250 femtomoles of this other peptide. Why? Because the intensity of a peptide in a mass spectrometer, it does depend on the amount, of course, but also on the peptide composition. So each peptide, it has a different response to the mass spectrometer and it gives a different signal. So how can we solve that? We need to compare the same chemical species. For example, in label free quantitation, which is one of the categories of methods that we use in proteomics, what we do is we compare the same chemical species in different injections. So for example, we run our control sample, we measure the intensity, and we run our problem sample, and we measure the intensity. This is fine because we are comparing the same chemical species. And then, as we know that the response of the two peptides are the same, we can make a ratio and calculate uh, the difference between the two samples. Another strategy is to use heavy standards. What are heavy standards? Heavy standards are peptides that are modified with heavy isotopes. For example, in this case, lysine has been modified all the carbon 12s uh, are now carbon 13 and all the, all the uh, nitrogen 14 are now nitrogen 15. Then what happens is that the delta mass from a standard lysine and this lysine is eight daltons. So still there is, they are almost the same compound. The only difference is this isotopic composition, but the response is pretty similar and we st still can compare these two intensities, okay? These are the two main strategies that we use. But still, if we are doing it right, we know we are doing it right because we are comparing these peptides, which are the same chemical species, we need to be in a certain uh, amount range. So of course, if the amount of the peptide is very low, we are not going to identify it, so we cannot quantify it. So if we are below the limit of detection, it doesn't work. But still, we need to be in this linear dynamic range, which is between this lower limit of quantitation and this upper limit of quantitation, in which the response is linear, meaning that if you have twice the amount, you have twice the intensity. This not always is like this. If you have very high amount, it can happen that this response is not linear anymore. So 
Now, today, we are going to talk about discovery, quantitative proteomics, and we don't do anything about this. But when you work in targeted, like tomorrow, you will need to be more aware of that. Of course, we, it would be good if we were aware of this, but for doing this, we need to do curves of concentrations of different peptides, and when we are working with thousands and thousands of peptides, this is not feasible. But you need to be aware of that. that Quantitation cannot be done at any concentration. It has to be done at a certain range, which is this linear dynamic range. And this applies to, to this label free and also when we are uh, working with this light and heavy version of the same peptide. Okay, another th consideration. So, as we saw yesterday, unfortunately, we are still not able to work with protein as well as we work with peptides. So, what we use for quantification is the peptide. The peptide is a surrogate to determine the protein quantitation. Okay? Oh, I'm sorry. Then we are assuming that the, ef the efficiency of the digestion is complete. That if we have one picomol of the protein, we will get one picomol of the peptide. This is not always true. So it can happen that we have 25% of the peptide is not completely cleave because, for example, we have two lysines together and then the efficiency of the, of the trypsin has decreased a bit. And then we have this 25% that it's not completely digested. So <clears throat> this is, of course, important. But uh, if the digestion is reproducible enough, meaning that we have one sample and, okay, we have this 25% of missed cleavage in here, and we have this other sample, but the percentage of uh, missed cleavage is uh, the same because the reproducibility of the digestion is high, then it means that we can still relatively quantify. What do I mean with relative quantification? Okay, so we have two types of quantification. We have this relative quantification in which I'm interested in saying that I have twice more in one sample than in the other. Okay, this is relative. And there is another concept which is this absolute quantification. And in this absolute quantification, we don't want to say that we have more or less in one sample or in another. We want to say the amount of protein that we have in one sample. So if we go to this level, we see that we have a full change of two. And if the digestion is reproducible, although not complete, we still can quantify. But of course, only relatively, not absolutely. And when do we use these different types of quantifications? So we use this relative quantification commonly to differentiate between biological states. So I would say that most of the quantitative uh, data that we have, it's relative. But in some cases, we can be interested in having this absolute quantification. For example, uh, if you want to determine the copy numbers per cell of a particular protein, then you need to to work with absolute quantitation. And for doing this absolute quantitation, we need a analytical, uh, uh, we need standard, peptide standards, that are usually isotopically labeled and very accurately uh, quantified. Okay? Well, another consideration. We need replicates. Why? For example, imagine I have my control sample and I get a value of three of whatever quantitative method I'm using. And then I have my test sample and I have a value of five. Is it changing? What do you think? Yes, no? We don't know. We don't know because we don't have replicates. So it can happen, in this, as in this case, that we have in here a lot of variability and in here also a lot of variability, which would mean that we don't have any change. Or it can happen that the value is very reproducible and very accurate, and then we can say that this is changing. 
That is why we need replicates. And of course, this is, these are very clear examples that are not real. So when we work with real examples, what we do is to apply statistical tests to determine if there is a change between groups. But for doing uh, some statistical, we need replicates, of course. So this is something I want to stress a bit because um, a lot of our users, they come with two samples, one of each state, and they want us to determine that changes so this is not possible, okay? So it's important that you be aware that in order to do any quantitative approach, you need to use replicates. And if we want to use this, for example, uh, a t-test to determine if two sets of data are significantly changing, uh, we need to work with uh, data that, is, that has a normal distribution. Okay, and the standard data, the ratios, that it's what we are using, uh, they are not uh, in a normal distribution because, for example, if we are calculating this B divided by A ratio, if A is bigger than B, we can have values between zero and one, and if A is less than B, we can have ratios between one and infinitum. So the drawing that we have is like this, and uh, of course, this is not a normal distribution. How do we solve this? We make a log scale, a, a logarithm of these uh, values. And then uh, the good thing is that now all the ratios that we have when A is greater than B are uh, negative, and all the ratios that we have when A is less than B are positive. And we have this type of distribution, which is much more appropriate to apply a statistical tests. That is why uh, you will see if you work in this field that uh, when we work with these ratios, we always uh, transform the ratios to the logarithm scale. Okay, another thing to discuss, the missing values. So acquisition of MS, MS data is a process that is stochastic. What do I mean? So we are using these top three, top 10, top 20, top whatever methods. I always put that top three because it's simpler to understand. So it can happen that you inject one sample and in a certain cycle, you get these three peptides selected for a fragmentation. And you can even inject the same sample and it can happen that instead of this, it take this one. Why? Because the chromatography is not completely identical. The changes are, um, can be that it's not completely reproducible. So it can happen that in one injection you have values for two other replicates for a particular peptide, and in another, uh, in the other sample, you have only one value for this particular peptide in the three replicates. And what can we do with that? We have seen it's, if we don't have enough values, we cannot quantify, okay? So this is a problem in quantitative proteomics. There are several strategies to try to solve it. So this afternoon, you will work with Max Quan that applies this match between RAMs, uh, which I'm, not, I'm now going to explain, but there are other softwares that apply similar approaches to try to find these missing values because the information is in there. I mean, you have this peptide in the sample, but it has not been selected for fragmentation because the sample is so complex that each time you inject the sample, it takes one peak or another. It doesn't have to be the same all the time. So in here, for example, you have the control sample that it has been identified. It's not a missing value. And in the test sample, the peptide has not been identified, but you have a peak at the same rotation time and with the same exact mass. So you can extrapolate that it's the same peptide, although you don't have a fragmentation data. Okay? Do you follow me? Okay. <coughs> this you will see this afternoon. Okay, now I will start to explain different methods for uh, quantitation. So there are many classifications. I have done one classification, but uh, we could have used many others. 
I have started uh, with a category which is called chromatography based quantitation. Uh, of, of course, when a peptide is uh, eluting from a chromatographic column, it starts to elute and we have a signal in the MS1 scan, which is small, and the time is passing and that in the intensity of the peak is increasing up to a top and then it's decreasing. So for each peptide, we can draw a, a peak, which is the chromatographic extraction of the mass over the time, okay? The size of, the, of this peak is proportional to the concentration of this peptide. And then if we measure this area or this peak, we can evaluate what is the concentration of the analyte, always when we are comparing uh, the same species, of course, okay? So uh, I'm not sure if everyone understands this figure. I think it's important that you understand it. So remember that in a top end method, you have MS1 and then several MS2. Each time you do an MS1, you measure the mass of a peptide. And uh, when a peptide starts to elude, the peak is very small, then it increases the intensity up to the maximum, and then it decreases, okay? And this is, you can draw a line between the maximum of the intensities in each spectrum, and you can draw a peak, okay? So we use this chromatographic peak. This is not anymore a peak in the spectrum. This is a chromatographic peak, which we have extracted from the intensity of the peaks in the spectrum. We can use these peaks to measure, uh, we, we can use different parameters to measure the size of this peak. We can use the intensity, or we can use the area and delta curve, okay? So we prefer to use the area and under the curve because it's more sensitive to non-perfect peaks. For example, this peak is pretty nice and very symmetric, but this one, it has a tail that if you only consider the intensity, it would not take into account. So we prefer the area versus the intensity, although some methods uses intensity. Okay, another important point is the peak shape. So we are reconstructing a, a, a peak and we are reconstructing a peak using the information that we have in the MS1, okay? So it's important that some, um, the, the cycle time, because if the cycle time is very long, we are going to have very few points in the chromatographic peak. So a standard peak, a chromatographic peak, could last like 30 seconds. So if we have a cycle time of three seconds, we should have uh, 10 points over the peak, which would be enough to reconstruct the peak in, in, a, in a good way. But imagine that the cycle time is super long and it's like eight seconds, then we will have only three peaks and the peak shape would be very bad. It, this does not reflect the uh, true uh, drawing of the peak. So this is another thing that it's important and you will see a bit more tomorrow in targeted proteomics. Okay, this is an example of a real peak of 12 seconds and how the peak is reconstructed if the cycle time is 1.2 seconds, we have 10 points and we can draw the peak very well. If it's 2.4 seconds, then we are losing a bit the shape of the peak, and as we increase the cycle time, we have uh, a worse reconstruction of the peak. Okay, N then I'm gonna put two uh, examples of this chromatography-based quantitation. So one example would be the label-free, which we have already mentioned, in which we have a sample a control and a sample, you digest them, and you compare the area under the peak of the two peptides, and then you do a ratio. This is one way of quantitation. Another technology, which is very spread, is uh, the SILAC technology. In this technology, you have your control sample that is grown in standard lysine, 
and then you have your, your test sample in which you grow in heavy lysine. You remember this heavy lysine that we were showing in the beginning that it's a Dalton different from our standard lysine. So all the lysines in here are normal and all the lysines in here are heavy. So we can distinguish between these two based on its mass. Okay? So we can mix the two proteins and digest them and we can extract the area under the peak of the masses corresponding to the heavy peptides and the light peptides. And then we do a single run. We don't, need, we don't need to inject them in parallel. We can inject them together because the mass is different, although the chemical species is the same, well, except for these heavy atoms. Okay, so there are drawbacks and advantages for each of the techniques. So for example, the label free, uh, you need to, hi to have a very high reproducible chromatography because if not, it's very hard to correlate the peaks. You have lots of missing values and you need more instrument time because you need to inject every sample per, uh, per separate. The advantage is that you don't need to use heavy isotopes and also the complexity that we will discuss later. With the SILAC uh, approach, well, in principle, although we see later that it's not completely true, it's a metabolic uh, labeling. So it's only feasible in living systems. So if you, for example, have a tissue, it's hard to, you cannot label this tissue because you are not going to grow it. You can do it in cell lines or even in living uh, animals like mice. Mice has been labeled with heavy lysines, not in humans. It has not been done yet, although I think theoretically it's possible, but I don't know if someone would be a volunteer for that. <laughs> So it's costly because you need these heavy amino acids that they have a price. And uh, the sample increases the complexity. Why? Because for each peptide, now you have two signals, one for the light and one for the heavy, or even three, because SILAC can be done also in a three-state SILAC, which we see later. And also another point is that the multiplexing is limited. So until now, all the examples that I'm telling to you is like control and test. But um, most of the times you have uh, different states to compare, six, 10 or more. So with SILAC, you can do up to three, so it's not that good. The good thing is that you don't need such a good uh, chromatographic reproducibility because you do just a run, so and that the quantitation is very easy because you know the difference between the heavy and the light peptides, so it's very easy to be automated and extracted the masses of the corresponding heavy and light ions. <coughs> okay, this is how SILAC data looks like. So in here we have the extracted ion chromatogram of the light and the heavy. You see they, they have the same retention time, of course. And if we look at the spectrum, we see this is a double charge peptide. And uh, so the difference, it's not eight anymore, it's four now. And this is the light form and the heavy form. So what we would calculate is the, the extracted ion chromatogram of this mass and the extracted ion chromatogram of this mass. We would calculate the area under the curve of these chromatographic peaks and we would do a ratio. As I told you before, uh, there are different combinations uh, for doing SILAC. This is one example in which they use three states. In the state A, you have uh, the light versions of lysine and arginine. In the state B, you have lysine with four uh, heavy atoms and arginine with six heavy atoms. And in the state C, you have uh, lysine with eight heavy atoms and arginine with 10 heavy atoms. So you can mix up to three uh, states in order to have, and then you will have these three uh, peptides in each spectrum 
Okay, I told you before that SILAC is only uh, useful for living systems, but this is not completely true, because as I told you, you can, you can generate a heavy mice, feeding them with this heavy lysine, and this can be done, can be used as, a, as internal standards. So imagine that you are interested in this heart tissue, Okay, it's not labeled because uh, you have not labeled the, the mouse, but uh, you have these um, mice that they have been labeled, so you can use this uh, as a standard, okay? And you can uh, spike this, um, these proteomes into your sample in order to uh, to make ratios and calculate the abundance of these proteins. And you can use these silic mice, which is very fancy, but I don't think that so many people are using it because it's very expensive to generate. You can also use pool of different silic uh, labeled cells from different tissues and use them as, <coughs> a, as, a, as these heavy uh, peptides, okay? I'm sorry. Okay, SILAC has been used also to study protein turnovers. For example, in this example, uh, cells are grown in one SILAC state or in heavy, in light lysine, for example, and at a point <coughs> you put the cells in a heavy medium, and then you know that all the proteins that are heavy labeled are newly generated. So this is an interesting approach. And uh, this is also explained in, uh, in, this, in this slide. So this is the standard SILAC in which you have your control uh, cells and your experiment cells. One is heavy, the other is light. You mix them and you measure the ratios. We have already seen that. And then what you can do also is to have your control and your experiment in light amino acids. And then you change the media to heavy in one case, and to medium, which was this three-state silac that we were seeing before, and you mix it. And what you had in here is that the proteins that were existing before are in the light form. The proteins that are generated in, uh, in the experiment are in the medium form, and the proteins that are generated in the control experiment are in the heavy form, okay? These are different ways of applying SILAC. Okay. Until now, we have done this chromatographic-based quantitation methods, and, and now we are going to move to another type of quantitation, which is spectrum-based. And I'm going to put two examples of this also. So we have seen this uh, label-free stuff that I was explaining to you with this Arian data curve and so. But we can do also label-free spectra base. What does it mean? So we have a control sample, a digest sample, we run our, our uh, samples into our mass spectrometer system, and then we count the spectrum that are assigned to each protein, okay? And this is a very uh, approximate method, but uh, some people are using it. So the assumption that you make is that the peptide and protein abundances can be estimated based on the number of acquired PSMs, or peptide spectrum matches, that Christian was mentioned in the previous class. So <coughs> you have your sample, uh, your control sample, you count the number of spectra associated to a particular protein, and you count the number of, of spectra uh, associated to the same protein in the other sample, and then you make a ratio. Of course, this seems that it's going to be very wrong, but it's not that wrong. And also, uh, these approaches, uh, although it's a rough estimation, there are different methods that, for example, they normalize by taking account into account the size of the protein. Because, of course, if the protein is bigger, you are going to have more peptides and you are going to have more spectra associated to this 
to this uh, protein. So, well, I think you need to know about these approaches, although it's not my favorite one. Okay, and that, now we are going to move to a more, much more sophisticated approach, which is the isotope tag tagging by chemical reaction. Okay, in this approach, we work with uh, uh, specific regions. Okay, these regions are commercially available. There are different brands. Today we are going to focus on one called TMT, but there are others that you might have heard about it, like iTrack. Okay, so these regions, they have three parts. One part is an amino reacting group that reacts with aminos of our proteins or peptides. Then you have this part of here that, well, I have to say that, for example, for TMT, you have six different versions of TMT. The six different regions, they have the same mass, but uh, this mass, the mass of the parts, are different, okay? So you will see it in more detail in the next slide. I just want to point out in here that you have these three parts in the region. One part is a reacting group that reacts with the amino groups in the protein. And then you have this isobaric tag, which in all the regions, they have the same mass, but then the mass of the balance and the reporter is different, okay? So this is the, uh, the example that I want to use to explain this. This is the TMT tax. This is a six plex, meaning that you can uh, label six different states, which is uh, an, ad an advantage uh, towards other techniques that are not uh, so easy to mul multiplex. And you see this is the protein reaction group. Well, let's this is the amino reacting group, which is used to attach the reactive to the protein. And then we have this uh, mass reporter, which is different for each of the regions. So this has a mass of 120, 126, 127, 128, 129, 130, and 131. And this is done by labeling with heavy atoms that atoms that are marked with an asterisk, with a red asterisk, you see? And for example, the lighter of the regions, it does not have any heavy atom in the mass reporter side, but then to compensate the mass, it needs to have a lot of heavy atoms in the balance. So the point is that this part, it has to have the same mass in all the regions, okay? You see that? And then what happens? Well, what happens is that you have, for example, six samples, like in here. You do the digestion of the, of the samples. And then each of the samples you label with one of these regions. And then you mix the six regions. Then you will use, a, well, we'll see it better in the next slide. So the six peptides from the six different uh, samples, they will have the same mass because all the regions, they have the same mass. When we do a fragmentation, an MS2, they will have the same fragmentation pattern. And the only difference is that you will have this, MS, this different reported ions that come from the region. So this part, during the fragmentation, this part is broken and you have in the spectrum signals from these six different masses. The balance is lost as a non-charged species, so you don't see it in the spectrum. You only see this part, and this is what allows you to quantify, okay? Uh, any question? I don't understand the yeah, I mean, you need a balance because uh, all the regions, they have to have the same um, mass. All the molecule. All the molecule that you attach to the peptide in the six different versions, they have to have the same mass. If the reporters are different, you need a balance, which is another part of the molecule that compensates this difference that you have in the reporters. Okay, 
This is just to compensate the mass, but you don't see in that spectrum. You only see the reported part of the region. Okay, the main drawback of this method, I would say, is the interf interference effect. What does it mean? Uh, this is an MS1 of our peptide of interest, which is in blue. When we isolate a precursor for MSMS fragmentation, we don't isolate like very small window. We always isolate like two Dalton windows, for example, in order to uh, be able to detect all the uh, isotopic envelope. Okay? In very complex samples, it's very easy that you have an interference very close to your peptide, that it's co-isolated with your peptide, and it's fragmented also. And then this peptide uh, will interfere in the quantitation because it will have their own ratios in the state. And it has been demonstrated that for very complex samples, there is a high distortion of the ratios because of this, because of the co-isolation of precursors. Of course, you could say then, let's make the window smaller, not isolate two Daltons, but less but then you lose a lot of sensitivity. So it's not very recommendable. So one of the approaches to solve this ratio distortion is uh, the MS3 that we have not talked about it yet, I think, or maybe in the first session with Eduard, no, no, okay. <laughs> so, well, uh, until here, it's what we have already seen. You do an MS1, you select a peptide, you fragment it, but then we have this co-isolation effect that I was saying, that maybe you have isolated another peptide, you have a mixture in here, and the reporter ratios are not very accurate. And to solve this, what you do is to select a fragment of the peptide, and you fragment it again, okay? This avoids the co-isolation because it's very, it's not very prob probable that you have a fragment from the impurity that you have co-isolated close to this fragment. It's not very, there is not a very high probability of this happening. And then this precursor is pretty pure in your peptide. And you can still uh, break it and, uh, and use this uh, reporter ion quantitation from the TNT regions, okay? This has a very big disadvantage, which is, as I told you before, in the other solution that I was uh, proposing you, it's that you decrease the sensitivity a lot. Because each step of MS that you do, you, you lose sensitivity. To solve this, uh, this multi-notch MS3 uh, approach has been proposed, in which you uh, in the standard MS3 approach, you just take one ion and you break it in order to, to obtain the TMT reporter. In this multi-node, you co-isolate several fragments of the peptide in order to break it and obtain the uh, ratios. And this increases the sensitivity. All this work, it has been done by the GIGIS group, which it, it was also mentioned in the previous class, I think. So they do really nice things with these TMT regions. So another thing that they have proposed is this TMT10. So multiplexing is an issue. We have seen that. We want to have as many states as possible because maybe in your experimental design you have many states and you need an approach to, to be able to analyze all together. So the first version of this TMT was the sixplex version that I was talking to you. But there is a new version of these TMT regions, which is this TMT10. This TMT10, uh, <clears throat> you have the same uh, regions as in the TMT6, plus versions of the regions 127, 28, 29, and 30. How are, are these versions? Okay, this, these versions take advantage of the mass defect of uh, the atoms. What is the mass effect? So in here, uh, 
you can see an explanation for an atom of helium-4. So the mass of an atom is less than the sum of its parts. What do I mean? For example, in the case of helium-4, you have two protons and two neutrons. And the, th the mass that could correspond to these four particles is this. But, well, it's hard to see, but it's 4.03. But in reality, the mass of the helium nu nucleus is a 4.00. Okay? So the mass defect is this difference. And the mass that is lost is converted into energy that is used to keep the um, particles together. Okay, this is a physical uh, phenomenon that happens. And we can take advantage of this because, for example, if you take uh, an atom of carbon-12 and an atom of nitrogen-15, the sum of that, the integral name, is 27. And if you take a carbon-13 and a nitrogen-14, that sum is also 27. But if you go into the decimals, you will see that there is a 6 millidaltons difference between these two combinations, okay? And this can be used to multiplex more uh, heavy regions. So, and this is the, the approach that they have been used in this case. So, for example, if you would, we take a look to this TMT-127, we have the N version and the C version. In the N version, the atom that is labeled is the nitrogen, and in the uh, C version, the atom that is labeled is a carbon. So at the end, what we have is the six regions that we had before, but these four in the middle, they have a double signal because they are either N or C regions, okay? Of course, this needs to be done with a very high resolution uh, instrument because if not, we are not going to be able to distinguish between these two peaks, okay? Okay, so we have done this classification. Uh, so how do we can quantify either integrating chromatographic peaks or using information that we found in the spectrum? But as I told you, uh, well, we have seen these two examples, this label-free chromatography base and this SILAC. And in the spectrum base, we have seen this label-free spectral counting and this TMT. Okay? But there are other examples that we have not covered, but you need to know that there are more techniques that are the same type. But we can also classify the methods in uh, which signal do we use for quantitation, okay? We can use either the signal from MS1, as we have done in SILAC or in label-free chromatography base, or we can use uh, signals that comes from the MS2, as we have done in the TMT or in the label-free spectral counting. Other methods apply in one or another category, depending on the method. <laughs> and another possible classification is how do we label with stable isotopes. So we have seen that one very common strategy is to use heavy uh, versions of our peptide. How do we introduce these heavy atoms it can make another classification. So we can introduce these heavy atoms uh, by metabolic labeling, like in SILAC, or by chemical reaction, like in TMT. And there is another approach that we have not discussed because, well, not many people are using it, which is mm, using an enzymatic reaction. Okay. Tomorrow, the day is dedicated to targeted proteomics, which is also quantitative proteomics, but in a smaller list or in a more targeted mm, manner. And there are other techniques that have been developed more in this targeted field that you will see tomorrow. And just as a summary, uh, I want you to remind that we are quantifying peptides, not proteins, that we need to compare the same chemical species either in two different ranks or using isotopically labeled uh, compounds, that there are different ways of introducing these uh, heavy peptides that we can use either area under the curves of spectra to do the quantitation 
at that, and then the quantitation can be done either in MS1 level or in MS2 level. So as you have seen, there is a wide variety of methods and well, what is important is that when you have your project and you decide which method you're going to use, you understand it and, and, and you can go deeper into this method. Okay? It's impossible that in one hour I explain you very carefully all the methods. So I just tried to do an overview and I hope that you like it. <laughs>